Are you ready to scale and outsource your business? Okay, let's go. Welcome to the Outsourcing and Scaling Show. I'm your host, Nathan Hirsch, a show where we talk about everything Amazon, Shopify, e-commerce, and digital marketing. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to Outsourcing and Scaling. Today we have a very special guest, Steve Chu. Steve, how are you doing today? Pretty good, man. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Steve runs a popular blog, My Wife Quit Her Job, where he teaches others how to sell physical products online. He also runs an e-commerce store with his wife called Bumblebee Linens and an e-commerce conference called the Seller Summit and a Shark Tank-like show called the Five Minute Pitch. Steve, that's a quite an impressive background. Why, why don't we take a step back? I don't want to go too much into your childhood, but give us, a, give us a glimpse into what you were like growing up. Were you a rebel? Were you a straight A student? Did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? I'm Asian, so uh, I went the straight A student route. I uh, always knew that I wanted to become an electrical engineer when I grew up, and so that's what I did. I studied engineering, and I actually had no intention of going to e-commerce or business at all, um, pretty much uh, growing up. But what ended up happening was, uh, you know, my wife, when we, she became pregnant with her first child, she wanted to quit her job, and we live in the Silicon Valley, pretty much need two incomes to get a good house and a good school district. Right. She told me she was going to quit, and that's when we started looking at business opportunities. And what year was that? That was 2006. Okay, so that's even before I got into e-commerce. What was e-commerce like back then? It was the wild, wild west. Um, I ended up using an open source shopping cart that I'm still using today. Basically, th there weren't the Shopify's or the big commerces, or they were very much in its infancy. So you had to pretty much do a lot of things by hand from scratch. So, so your wife wanted to quit your job. You, you kind of got into e-commerce. Walk us through that. How'd you come across it? How'd you start it out? How'd you learn it? Was it all, all self-taught? Yeah. I mean, okay. So we kind of stumbled into it when, uh, when we got married, my wife knew she was going to cry. And so she was looking for handkerchiefs everywhere. We couldn't find any in the States that she liked. And then we found this factory in China, ended up importing them. You, we imported a bunch. We used maybe a handful of them, and then we sold the rest on eBay, and they ended up selling like hotcakes. And that's kind of how we decided to start that handkerchief store when she became pregnant with our first child. What was the second part of that question? <laughs> um, yeah, what, what was it like kind of building it up? I mean, you said you sourced yeah. from China. I'm assuming there weren't any classes like there are today saying, hey, this is how you source from China. These are the mistakes to avoid. What was that? That's correct. Um, when we first started out, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we actually had the vendor handle everything for us for our first couple shipments and then just gradually got more bold, tried different things. In terms of the uh, the website, fortunately, I have a technical background, so I was able to get that up, uh, you know, basically for free, you know, the shopping cart part. Stitching together all the credit card processing, all that stuff had to be a little bit manual back then as well. Um, but yeah, it's all self-taught. I th there's, there's some luck involved also. My... Um, my brother-in-law happened to be working for Google. He kind of taught me how to do AdWords, or he suggested AdWords. That's how we got a lot of our early business. Uh, we also started content marketing like way before it was sexy, and we kind of stumbled upon it by accident, really. Uh, and that's how we got our initial sales. Very cool. So you're growing this business. How long before it, it took off? You found the supplier, you built the website, you start running Google ads. Give us that time period. Yeah, I mean, it depends what your definition of takeoff was. But our goal for that first year was to actually make $60,000 in profit, but we ended up doing six figures in profit, which right. was instantly how much my wife was making at the time. And so she was able to quit her job. Very cool. So you're running this business and then how long after until you launched the blog and how come you did it? Oh yeah. So the blog uh, didn't happen until a year later. I got inspired to do blogging by this guy named Steve Polina. He wrote this post called How to Make Your First Love Dollar. And at the time, you know, all he does is write. And I think he was only monetized via AdSense back in the day. And AdSense is like this ad network that Google has. And he was making $4,000 a day off of AdSense. And that kind of inspired me to document my experiences. It was crazy. So, so what was the initial stage of setting up a blog? How many posts were you writing? Did you just throw it together? Did you create some master plan? That, no, no master plan at all. Um, I spent 10 bucks starting that thing, uh, just a WordPress site on Bluehost. And I, it, in the beginning, I was writing every single day. And then that kind of burned me out. And then gradually, it went down to three posts a day and then one post a day. And I maintained that one, sorry, not one post a day, one post a week. Right. And then I maintained that pace for the last, 
Good Lord, it's been 10 years now, I think. So, so what was the original purpose of the blog? Was it to get content out there? Did, did you have a goal and has that purpose kind of changed over time? Yeah, I mean, the long-term goal was to be like Steve Poblina, right? But uh, the other goal was to kind of keep a journal of my business progress. And the, it's funny, things never work out the way they are. I, I thought my friends would be really interested in this because we were all having families around the same time, but none of them read it at all. And it was just these random people that started finding it online and started asking me questions. And that kind of inspired me to continue writing. And it also inspired me to create this training class that teaches e-commerce, which I released, I think, uh, two years later after I started blogging. So talk to us about this class. Or is it more focused off Amazon? Is it Amazon? Is it a combination of both? Yeah, a great question. It started out as nothing to do with Amazon because back in the day, Amazon wasn't around, right? Right. Back in that time frame. But since then, it's evolved uh, over time. And so now it has, you know, basically 50% uh, Amazon, 50% selling on your own store. And the, you know, the recommended flow I have now actually is to start out on Amazon make sure that your product sells. And then once you know you're going to stick with it, then create a store around those products. Cool. So you started your store, you started the blog, you start teaching other students. How did the, the conference seller summit come to be? Oh, yeah. so you're four. And I imagine that that's a big endeavor, just an endeavor, just starting off a, a big conference. It is. Yeah. I, I had no intention of starting a conference. I had no intention of even starting that training class. It was just basically based on demand. People wanted to meet each other. People wanted to get together. And people were just asking me to throw some sort of event. I knew nothing about events, but fortunately at an event, I met um, my partner, Tony Anderson, and she had been running events for like seven or eight years. And we had this pact. So I, uh, you know, she told me, hey, you get the speakers, you sell the tickets, and you get the sponsors, and then I will handle all the conference stuff. You just need to show up. And so that was enough for me to just – give the whole conference thing a try. Um, fortunately, it, it was successful, but it is actually quite nerve wracking. Yeah, I think throwing a conference is it's hard, it's risky, it's a lot of time and money. What did you learn in those first few years? Maybe someone listening out there is thinking of starting their own conference, what should they know? Yeah, I think the best way to do it is to start out small because you are putting your money up front. You have to fill those hotel rooms, right? Otherwise, you're, you're up for the bill. So what I would do is um, I would actually email your list and see how much interest there is and just create a sub list of people who are interested in it and then try to pre-sell tickets. And based on how many tickets that you can sell, then create the size of your event according to your pre-sell quota. That's the safest way to do it. I did not do it that way, however, <laughs> but that's how I would do it again if I were to start all over. Got it. So you got a lot of stuff going on right now. How do you divide up your time in 2019 and what are you most focused on? Yeah, uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I assume you're asking about business. I'm actually the most focused on my kids right now. Okay. Um, but outside of the kids, um, I've been just focusing more on projects that I enjoy doing as of late. Um, I don't actually spend that much money. I'm quite frugal. And so the amount of money that I make across the e-commerce store, the blog, the conference, and all that stuff is more than enough uh, you know, to, to make a living. And so that's how 5-Minute Pitch came about. Um, I was hanging out with my buddies, Greg Mercer, Scott Volker, and Mike Jackness late at night at the Seller Summit, and we were like, hey, you know what? I think we should do a Shark Tank show. You guys want to do a Shark Tank show? Yeah, sure. And so we just decided to do this show, and it's been a whole lot of fun. And again, this is a project that makes zero dollars. Right. Um, it's a good amount of time, but it's a fun project. That's awesome. So, so you're living more of that lifestyle business where you get to spend more time with your, your friends, your, your family. Um, you have these businesses that are somewhat running on autopilot. Yeah, how big is your team? I mean, this is the outsourcing and scaling <laughs> show. Take it us behind the scenes. Yeah, what's funny about this is like, I think I'm like the wrong guy for you to have on your podcast. <laughs> but, um, but okay, so to, to run the blog, I basically just have one VA in the Philippines to help me with that. Uh, for the event, I have Tony, and then we have two other people that we hire just to handle the day of stuff and, and the planning. Right. Um, for the e-commerce store, we have four employees. And those are actually physical employees that actually go in the warehouse and pack and ship orders. And then the, the, our Filipino VA, of course, helps out with, with that business as well. See, I think you're the perfect person for the show because it, it shows so many different ways that you can run a business. You've got people out there that are trying to build their empire. And every time they get a free hour, they're investing it back in their business. And then 
there's people that are, are frugal that are like, hey, I'm making enough money. My, my time is the asset and I want to invest that time into projects I like it and my friends and my family. <laughs> okay, if you say so, Nathan. <laughs> So tell us more about e-commerce in 2019. I mean, we kind of, I started in 2008. So like you said, it was the wild, wild west. And then people started to burst on the scenes. You had big players coming in and now everyone has a course and they're teaching and everyone wants yeah. to get involved. Where, where do you see e-commerce going in 2019 and beyond? I mean, you know, I've always preached having your own website and having your own brand and building your own audience. And a lot of these courses out there, they're preaching like sell on Amazon, sell on Amazon. But you know, guess what? Amazon's been doing a lot of dirty things lately. Right. So, uh, for example, a number of my friends, when they're advertising on Amazon, they have a listing. But right in the buy box is an ad for Amazon's branded product at like a third of the price or half the price of what they're selling. So, Amazon is leveraging their private label products and their power on the platform to steal business away from third-party sellers. Um, Amazon's been changing up the rules. There's lots of Asian sellers on there doing knockoffs. Uh, one of my buddies, Kevin Williams, he had his product knocked off and he spent like, I think over a million bucks fighting it wow. to get these knockoffs off. So, you know, unless you have some sort of mind share or your audience, you can make money in the beginning. Um, don't get me wrong. Like, but it, it, if your product becomes super popular, it's going to be ripe for knockoffs. And unless you have that strong brand, unless you have your own audience, unless you have customer loyalty, then in the long run, at least, your margins are gonna erode. Right, and, and let's talk about marketing too, because you said, I recommend having your own website, and, and I consider you a marketing expert as much as I consider you an e-commerce, and, and if you can't market nowadays, I, I feel like you're missing that, that whole bubble. You're 100% relying on Amazon. So how do you see marketing changing, and, and any marketing tips for people listening? Yeah, I mean, See, the thing about Amazon is you don't really have, to, Amazon does the marketing for you. Right. Way, right. They have this huge built-in audience, but unfortunately also beholden to them as well. And so when it comes to marketing, um, I mean, that's a really broad question you asked, Nathan, but in, in the long run, it takes a customer, I would say between four to eight touch points to get to know you. And so basically what you need to be doing is you need to be gathering you need to have a way to bring people back over and over and over again until they are ready to buy. So whether that be through email, Facebook Messenger, push notifications, whatever, I mean, you need their contact info so you can bring them back. And that's, that's probably one of the fundamental things that you need to do in, in marketing today. Very cool. Well, Steve, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I'd love to hear more about where people can find you, uh, more about the Seller Summit, what you're excited about there, get people to, to buy some tickets. And I know I'll be there, I'm excited for it, it's my first one. Um, but yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, so Seller Summit, uh, we've been sold out for over a month now. Uh, we All keep right. that event really small. Uh, it's it's only about 225-ish people. And uh, here's the thing, we, we eat together, we drink together at night, and everyone is there. Uh, it, it's, a fo it's a networking focus, focused conference. So by the end of the event, you should know almost everyone there. And what's funny is on the first day, everyone's a little squeamish about networking, but by the end right. of the event, everyone's like best friends patting each other on the back. So that's Seller Summit. Uh, my wife quit her job as a blog where I just talk about my experiences, as we mentioned before. I have a training class over at Profitable Online Store, and if you guys are uh, getting married, I can hook you up with some wedding handkerchiefs over at Bumblebee <laughs> Linens. We'll talk about that soon. Thanks, Steve, for coming on. Hi, right, man. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Did you enjoy this content? If so, click like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel so we can continue bringing you great content all about hiring.